um, unfortunately. Uh, it's a quite relevant topic nowadays. And this presentation is part for an upcoming book that's called Hostile Environment that will publish by Z in this year, if I have good information. Um, it's also beyond the university, it's also part of the steering committee of the Sanctuary on Sea, the Brighton City um, the Sanctuary Group. That's an umbrella organization for refugee and migrant community support group in the city. Is working on several topics from geopolitics of migration, um, refugee inclusion through school and languages, and several other uh, quite interesting topics. But I will let the floor to Michael for this um, session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Um, this um, this project is is indeed hopefully be coming out fairly soon with Zed. I'm actually still writing the book, so I'll be very interested to, uh, to, to hear any responses that you have at the end of this, uh, this lecture, which will go into uh, to further refining these, uh, these ideas that, uh, that hopefully will, um, will, will speak to, to some of the, uh, the themes that you're interested in in relation to, uh, to this, uh, this topic. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to some of the discussion afterwards, so I'll try and uh, allow plenty of time for that uh, before I finish. So the, um, the term hostile environments that, um, that I pick up on is one that um, coined by Theresa May, formerly Prime Minister of the UK, when she was Home Secretary, to refer to a, a particular approach to undocumented migration to the UK. Um, and the overall argument of this book is that we should see that not in terms of a, a relatively precise, geographically defined set of policies within the UK, but a much broader set of approaches going back at least two decades within migration control to wealthy countries more, more generally. So this is the, the question that I want to start with. Why has this this increase in hostility that, that Theresa May vocalised. She made the creation of a hostile environment an explicit objective of migration policy. But certainly it was a characteristic of migration policy well before then. So how can we start to explain this basic um, observation that wealthy states are treating migrants increasingly badly? What, what explains this? What's the justification for it? Um, and I want to, to start in a slightly surprising position um, with Lord Business. If any of you have seen the, uh, the Lego movie of 2016, I found this particular character very useful in, uh, in understanding this relationship between political authority and mobility. Um, if any of you have seen this film, then the, the main objective of, uh, of Lord Business in this film is to glue together all of the other... Um, Lego characters, and to glue them down, thus preventing both mobility and hybridity in this case. And the fact that he's characterised as this sort of um, captain of industry, this lord business figure, highlights a particular relationship between capitalism and mobility, which runs through a lot of critical analysis of these, of these approaches. Oh, sorry. Um, Sandra Mazandra, for, for example, um, uses, I think, the uh, particularly um, powerful example of this, highlighting the fact that the, I'll read this out, the, uh, the tension between a politics of mobility and a politics of control lives at the very heart of capitalism's theory. And at different periods over the last three or four hundred years of the development of capitalism, the interest of organized capital has been at times to encourage mobility, to move people off the land into cities, for example, um, at times to discourage mobility, and most recently to, to limit mobility in particular ways. People like Nicholas de Genova, I think, have developed some very interesting analysis of the ways in which the the development of a pool of, of disenfranchised, marginalised labour is, is of particular interest to certain capitalist classes because it creates a certain easily exploitable pool of, of cheap labour. 
And that's a, a very plausible justification, I think, for, for immigration controls. Immigration controls exist um, in, in Ms. Adra's and De Genova's understanding not um, to, to stop migration entirely, but to filter out and to create this pool of, of easily exploitable labor. Um, and I don't think we can discount that entirely, but the enthusiasm with which politics of hostility towards migration have been pursued by, uh, by politicians across Western Europe and North America over the last couple of decades, I think goes significantly beyond that account and mean that, that this, I think, this otherwise very satisfactory account um, rooted in a, a Marxist understanding of capitalism explaining migration controls start to be more, more limited when we see very significant um, interest within organized capital campaigning against migration controls on a large scale, even within the, uh, some of the most recent stages, actually lobbying in, in the UK Parliament for much greater access to, uh, to labor markets of, uh, uh, of migrants, then this connection between capitalism and um, mobility control starts to break down, I think, in the way that, that at least Ms. Andra and, uh, and De Genova uh, account for it. So that we have to start to look elsewhere. I think to a certain extent, this, this remains a plausible theory, but there's clearly something else going on. And when we look at the connections between the, um, the, the more populist right movements across Western Europe, and the, uh, the connections with, uh, with capitalism, I think we need to look at a more cultural understanding for these um, restrictions on mobility rather than looking at, um, at organized capital as, a, as a, an explanation for these movements. So this, this paper is rooted in trying to, to identify the means and the implications of looking beyond capitalism as an explanation for mobility control. There's also um, a, um, a significant um, a significant movement in the strategy which has been taken up. This image is um, um, is uh, is by um, Jose Palazon. It's uh, the Melilla Golf Course in 2014. You may well have seen it. It's one of those images. Of, uh, around the, um, the rise in, in migration in 2015 and before that, that went viral. It was tremendously widely circulated in 2014 and 2015. And for me, it's an incredibly powerful image that captures the focus of um, this, this reasoning behind European migration control. Because once people get to the border, represented in this case by the, the perimeter of the golf course, um, it's really too late to, uh, to stop this movement. And I think the, the so-called crisis of 2015 really highlighted this, that, w that once people arrive at the border, stopping them is, is too late. There's, once people have got into boats, there's, there's another set of policies which need to, to take place. So migration policy has... Uh, certainly since then, and to a certain extent before then, focuses not at stopping migrants, but keeping migrants at a distance, keeping migrants away from not just presence on the territory, but away from the border itself, so that the uh, migration controls move away from a focus on migrants themselves and start to focus on potential migrants on people who are thinking about leaving, who haven't yet left, who are considering their, their possible plans. You know, this is the point at which um, European migration control increasingly aims to engage with migration. Because of this awareness that, that once people reach even the edge of European territory, there's a different set of obligations which are um, unleashed. So the, um, the significance of this geopolitical challenge, I think, is an important one. Europe, because it means that the, the control of potential migrants is not just a control of a group of people who are you know, objectively unknowable, 
It's impossible to know how many potential migrants there are. It's very, very difficult to know how many migrants there are in this context. But, um, but the number of potential migrants is an even greater to challenge. We can't even hypothetically know how many potential migrants there are. And potential migrants are located on the territory of other states. The, uh, an area over which the, uh, the legitimate control of violence or the control of legitimate violence um, is, is beyond the, the capacities of, of European states. So this traditional forms of control, exercising some form of direct or, or indirect violence, aren't directly accessible to the forces that seek to, um, to exercise that control. So this geopolitical challenge involves controlling non-citizens, an unidentified group of non-citizens, away from state territory. And that means that uh, a certain set of, um, of responses have developed. And it's in this context that, um, that I think we have to, to understand this, this turn to an explicit hostility. Theresa May's quote from initially from 2012 to, um, to create here in Britain a really hostile environment for illegal migration was novel because it articulated something which migration policies had been seeking to do for some time, in Britain, but, but also elsewhere, I think. Um, the, the, the image here is, is Banksy's um, entry to the Royal Academy exhibit of, of last year, which uh, emphasizes the, uh, or illustrates the, uh, the point that, uh, that I, I was making about the once people reach the border itself, then the, the aims of migration control are inevitably thwarted in some way. And, uh, and as we've seen, people almost inevitably are able to, uh, to reach the territory. So the focus of migration control has been on stopping people reaching the territory. And the, the argument that, uh, that I want to make here is um, firstly to characterize this geopolitical challenge in the Mediterranean and, and elsewhere on the, the prevention of departure the identification of, of potential migrants rather than actual migrants, and the shift from departure to the, to the prevention of, of arrival. And this sees borders um, in two ways. Um, firstly, as a form of deterrence. Um, as, we've, as we've seen in, in 2015 and, and since, and, and indeed before, um, border architecture itself is not sufficient to stop people entering the territory. As, no, it's a quote that, um, that you see um, regularly, but, um, but I was in, um, in Morocco researching um, work for this, uh, for this book about 10 years ago when I first heard somebody say, if you show me a five metre fence, I'll show you a six metre ladder. That's the, the, the sense of the, the inutility of, uh, of border um, architecture itself. Um, so architecture at the border, I think, has to be understood both as a form of deterrence focused at this unknowable group of potential migrants, but also as a, as a form of reassurance to a potentially concerned public on the territory as an example of toughness of government, that the government is doing something about this, uh, this issue. Um, a second area... That, um, that touches on this, that I want to mention in the context of, of Libya, is work around the humanitarian border, a term that William Walters coined in, in 2011, that um, Violetta Moreno Lacks has um, further analysed in, I think, very productive ways around ideas of, of protection by interdiction or rescue by interdiction um, as, um, as a form of a humanitarian alibi for otherwise um, regressive migration policies. And the impact of all this is, of course, not necessarily to reduce migration, um, to, to di displace that migration to other areas, um, highlighting hostility from general publics and increasing the danger that migrants take. So the, um, the result is not necessarily to to in reduce migration, but to increase fatalities that, uh, that migrants face. And ultimately, 
to damage faith in state institutions that claimed to be able to control migration when ultimately they, they struggle to do so. That's essentially the argument that, uh, that they want to go through in the next sort of um, 20 minutes or so. Um, so these, these two functions of, of hostility. Firstly, um, this is a, um, uh, a graphic that I've, uh, I've stolen from the, uh, from the internet that illustrates the, uh, the point that, uh, that I want to make particularly effectively, that the, the use of migration control not to stop migration, but to stop potential migration, I think is one of the only ways that we can explain this increased hostility. That increased hostility doesn't stop migrants who are actually present on the other side of the border, on the other side of the guichet, on the other side of you know, immediately face-to-face -face with the border control officer. As we know, levels of hostility that uh, the migrants face have increased. But the warnings that this sends to people who are thinking about migration have to be one of the, um, the objectives of this sort of, uh, this sort of treatment. So there is a, a significant deterrent effect in this turn to, uh, to hostility. There's also a significant, um, an intended reassurance that in the face of a, uh, a set of issues which are very complex, very confusing, very troubling, in some cases increase anxiety of certain um, groups of the population, that, um, that there is a response which the, uh, the government is, uh, is making. Of course, the implications of this, of the government saying we're acting toughly in response to this, uh, this threat, is to identify migration as a threat. To, to increase concern in many cases, to shift this you know, situation on the, uh, on the left of, uh, of caution to a, uh, a wider spread situation of, of panic amongst the population, enhancing concern around migration rather than alleviating that concern. Um, one of the, the other... Um, emblems that has helped me thinking through this is um, the, the television detector van in the UK, which is a very long-standing and, and unusually British institution that uh, since the, the early 1950s, um, there have been adverts on British television showing these, these vans, usually with some form of antenna. This is, a, I think, a 1956 version of this. Driving around the streets to encourage people to buy television licenses. The UK is one of, of relatively few countries around the world where individuals require a license to watch television. Um, and the claim of these, um, these vans was that they could identify when people were watching television. And you would see in these ads, people in, in vans looking at these very complex controls saying, yeah, someone in number 32 is watching channel four um, and then someone knocking on their door and saying, do you have a, a television license? And, and for a long time, people were suspicious of this, of this technology. And it wasn't until 2004 that the, uh, the British government finally admitted that actually it could never detect whether people had, um, had televisions at all. There, there was absolutely no way that this, these were just mock-ups. They were vans with big radars on top, film driving around streets. But there was an ability, an ability to claim a certain power that the state had that the state never had. And the, the basic intention of these adverts, of this very large publicity campaign, was a form of deterrence. It was the idea that if people thought they would be captured, and they would be much more likely to get a license. Of course, in this situation, the, the government could never oblige everybody to get a license, but if they scared people into getting a license, then this, this form of deterrence, and this is, I think, where the, the definition of deterrence as controlling through fear becomes more, uh, more accurate in, in terms of understanding this policy. And of course, in the UK, the, the use of vans, this is um, a, a, a campaign from, uh, from a few years ago around the UK, a series of vans that uh, drove around a number of London boroughs, a poster on the side, saying, in the UK illegally, go home or face arrest, um, text home and the particular number, and uh, the, the claim that there were 106 arrests last week in your area. Um, 
And this was criticised by, by Human Rights Watch across the uh, uh, human rights groups across the, uh, the UK. Um, there was a number of vans mocked up to, um, to mimic this sort of idea, accusing the Home Office of uh, illegally stoking up racist behaviour that Liberty put out. Um, and a huge range of complaints to the Advertising Standards Authority. The, uh, the only one of which was upheld, despite the, the, the clear racist intention of these vans, the, um, the vans were eventually banned after two months because the claim on the right, 106 arrests last week in your area, was deemed to be um, inaccurate because it was impossible to identify what your area was in this, in this case. So there was a, a clear political, geographical basis to the, uh, the final removal of these vans from the street. But the link that I want to make with this idea of the, of the TV detector van, that these were vans driving around, creating a message around the capacity of government to do something about a problem that people may or may not have identified that did nothing to address that problem but highlighted publicly to a concerned public that the government was doing something and in many cases um, elevated that concern. In fact, some, uh, some very interesting research at the University of Bristol um, in, in response to this that, that came out in 2015 by Hannah Jones, who read the, uh, led the research. I'll read this out. Um, this research concluded that government publicity campaigns that demonstrate toughness on immigration cause a significant minority of people to become more worried about irregular migration. This includes people who are scared that they're being targeted, both migrants and British citizens, and people who are worried that migration is out of control. So. The, the result of this research in response to this campaign of, um, of, of van you know, highlighting the, uh, the responses that uh, the people could make if they thought they were in the UK illegally was that, um, firstly, this targeted British citizens, ethnic minority British citizens who felt that they were being targeted even though, of course, they had every right to be in the UK and in many cases were born in the UK. Um, and individuals who hadn't really thought that migration was much of a problem before then. And then they see these vans patrolling the streets, and they think, well, hang on, maybe this is something that we should be worried about. We should be more worried about than we are. So rather than reassure people, this sort of campaign actually acts as a, uh, a significant form of um, elevation of that, of that anxiety. And the, the argument that I want to make, coming back to the, to the Mediterranean, is that we should understand the very significant development of border architecture around Europe, of which I think Ceuta and Melilla are perhaps <coughs> the, most, the most photographed of examples, um, in a similar way that, that border infrastructure like this has relatively limited effect on the people who want to get across it, of course, it means that they're more likely to hurt themselves when they, when they jump down. But the impact on the numbers of people getting across it is, is relatively limited, as far as, as, as we know. Um, it is much more likely to have an effect on people who are thinking about making this journey, to identify the fact that, that this is a dangerous journey that people don't want you to make, a deterrence effect and an effect on people who, who may or may not be concerned about migration, who, who live in the, uh, the territory, Europe understood more generally, since much of this was funded by the European Union, um, that the government is doing something in response to these, to these concerns. So the, um, and I think one of the, the most effective definitions of borders, an amazing book by Kapka Kasabova, that, uh, that came out a couple of years ago, just called Border, that, uh, that you may have read, um, in which she starts defining border as a, and she's just taking a straight dictionary definition of border, a band or strip, especially a decorative one, around the edge of something. I think if we, and I, I certainly don't want to, um, to, to belittle the, the suffering that, um, that these sorts of border fences have caused, but I think if we start to understand these, this sort of infrastructure, not as, as directly practical, but more in terms of sending a message, sending a message of deterrence outwards, 
and sending a message of supposed reassurance inwards, then this idea of a decorative border makes, makes much more sense. And it starts to explain why, in a context where political geographers um, like me have been arguing for 15 or 20 years that controls have been moving away from the border, that uh, we need to understand the border as moving outwards into the territories of surrounding states, inwards in terms of, uh, of post-entry controls, that the, the hostile environment was really intended to, uh, to ramp up, um, upwards to authorities like the European Union that, that exist above the nation state, and downwards to the individual body of the migrant in terms of um, biometric controls that uh, the people like Louisa Moore have been looking at in detail. This movement in, out, up, and down has characterized a lot of political geographical writing about the border for 15 or 20 years. And then all of a sudden in 2015, all of these structures start being built along the border. And many people interpreted that as a, um, as a refutation of this, this work developing this understanding of the border moving away from the physical border location. But I think if we understand border infrastructure, you know, massively expensive border infrastructure, like Satan and Malia, um, not as an attempt to stop people getting across this border infrastructure, but along the lines of this previous work, the movement of the border in, out, up, and down, then I think we get a, uh, a more realistic understanding of the actual intentions of this, sending a message out and in. This is a sort of public relations border rather than an actual um, effective um, control. Um, those people who have, um, have talked about the, uh, the border spectacle, and, and Nicholas de Genova is again one of the people who have, have coined this, I think, very useful term, have highlighted exactly this sort of performative aspect of the border. That the border is not to be understood as it is in and of itself, but it's understood in terms of the spectacle that it creates. And that spectacle creates its own publicity to convey this message both, both in and, and out. And, and work like this, I don't know if you can, you can read at the bottom, but this is a, uh, a photography uh, exhibition by Javier Ribas called Concrete Geographies, a, a, a theme that, um, that I think is, is very um, full of meaning in this context around the, the Ceuta border fence. And the, the whole series is really worth seeing, that um, it's a sort of um, postcard style. This, this um, whole series of photos of the Ceuta border are um, designed to look like sort of 1960s or 1970s posters. And if you look very carefully, you can see the, uh, the, the border fence here, but it's, it's not the main focus of this, um, of this this photo, and the whole series is very much like this, that they are they're photos of the location of the, the Ceuta border fence, and if you look carefully, you can see what's going on there. But it's almost denying this idea of the border spectacle. It's almost uh, you know, setting the, um, the, the elaborate construction of the border in its much wider environmental context and playing it down, refuting this idea of the, of the border spectacle as something which we should be impressed by or afraid of, depending on, on who we are. And in that context, I think it's a, it's a particularly useful um, artistic intervention in this case that highlights the, the problems of seeing the border in this tremendously spectacular fashion. And I want to move to the, the, the second um, point that I want to, to make here, which is to, to pick up on this idea of the humanitarian border. And, and particularly um, Violetta moreno Lax's ideas of um, initially protection or, or rescue through interdiction. That the, the engagement of um, humanitarian um, staff, humanitarian agencies, in attempting to, um, to stop people migrating um, through the notion of the humanitarian border has become... Um, characterized as a, as a humanitarian act, as an act which is vital to save lives, as, in, as indeed it is. 
You know, that, that's certainly an important part of this justification. But it also has the effect of preventing movement, of, of keeping people away from the, from the border. And I think um, this is one of the contexts that, um, that we can see operating in the way that um, international organizations responded to the, to the 2011 Libya crisis, which is the second theme of what I, what I want to talk about. One of the ways that this, uh, this happened is through information campaigns. And um, the, the best current example of this, I think, is the, uh, the Australian um, immigration um, campaign. The, the Australian government um, has produced a, a huge number of these, uh, of these posters, um, many of them in English, which I think is significant, um, but also translated in, in other languages, distributed around um, Afghanistan, Indonesia, a range of locations from which people are deemed to be interested in, in getting to, to Australia, with the idea that, that this will stop people moving. Um, the reason why I think it's significant that many of these are in English is because this highlights the, the point that I was making earlier, that a significant audience for these is not people thinking about moving to Australia, but, but Australians. The, um, the claim here that, um, whether you can read it at the back, the Australian government has introduced the toughest border protection measures ever. A right? sort of macho approach to, uh, to border control in that context that is, is clearly destined at an Australian audience. This is reassuring Australians that their government is doing something about a concern that, uh, that they are assumed to have in this context. Of course, almost all of the, um, um, the research that we have on information campaigns, including work that, uh, that I've been involved in myself, shows that they have almost no effect at all, partly because people are already well aware of the dangers involved in migrating. This is a, uh, uh, an individual from Ethiopia that we interviewed uh, in a project a couple of years ago. Um, Dalwitz said, uh, in the, Dalwitz is obviously not uh, his real name, and my mother does not want me to go but I want to go. I'll not tell my mother when I go. Sitting waiting for God to help doesn't work. One has to practice. I've tried DV lottery, but I didn't get it. I've tried to progress in my life, but now at 30, I've still not seen any, uh, any progress. So Dawit is well aware of the, the potential dangers involved in migrating in this case. Informing Dawit of the, of the dangers is not going to have any effect on his, uh, on his decision to go. He's aware that, uh, that there are, are concerns, but because he doesn't see any further advance in his life, that is what, what is motivating him to go. So information campaigns of the, the sort that Australia has invested in here might potentially reassure citizens of the, uh, of the countries that sponsor them that the government is doing something, although they're relatively cheap ways of doing something, information campaigns, but ultimately is not going to have a very significant effect on, on movement. In the context of, um, of Libya, this is the, uh, the Shusha um, refugee camp that was established soon after people started to... It was established in, in southern Tunisia, um, soon after people started to, uh, to leave Libya. Um, and the, um, I was involved in some research with UNHCR um, around this time, during 2011 and, and 2012, in southern um, Tunisia and, and Egypt. And the, the management of mobility away from Libya was particularly significant because this was engaged in a, a partnership between UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, and the International Organization for Migration. And people arrived at the border and they were asked if they could go home. That was essentially the screening question that, um, um, that, uh, that they were posed. And if they said yes, they could go home, then they were sent to the IOM camp. And if they said no, they didn't want to go home, they were sent to the UNHCR camp. Um, and as a result of that, um, the, the statistics on, on movement of, of non-Libyan nationals who left, who left Libya um, into either Tunisia or Egypt, 218,434 people were repatriated over that period, mostly by OM, but also involving UNHCR, if they did not express a concern about going home. Um, only 4,251 were, were ultimately resettled, and about 500, it's quite difficult to determine 
the exact number who, who remained um, in Tunisia, um, remained at the site of, uh, of Shusha Camp for some years after um, Shusha Camp closed, and Glenn de Garioli and Martina Tazioli have, have produced some really fantastic work documenting that um, the fate of those individuals who, uh, who stayed. That um, the, the result of this, once again, was a, a humanitarian organization, and, and a humanitarian organization that, that I have great admiration for, UNHCR, was essentially engaged in this process that Violetta Moreno Lacks has called, in a European context, her work is focused on, rescue without protection. So they were rescued from the, the Libyan situation, they were returned home, but there was very limited, arguably the 4,251 resettled refugees received some form of protection, but for the large majority of people who fled Libya in that context, protection was not the main focus of the, of the international response. And this is often the case in the particularly government-sponsored efforts to, to rescue people in the Mediterranean and return them to, uh, to Libya in this context. That this is creating further um, evidence of this use of rescue without protection that is essentially halting the movement of, of individuals who want to get to Europe, who want to, to seek some form of more durable protection at the, um, at the Mediterranean. So in order to, to leave time for, for questions, I want to, to conclude here. Um, this idea of deterrence as prevention by fear or controlling by fear is something that, uh, that I hope to, um, to characterize in detail through this book and through these, um, these brief examples that I've been able to give, to give here. But this doesn't have the, the desired or intended impact of preventing migration at all. All it does is changes the routes that people take and increases the dangers that they are um, uh, forced to, um, to go through in order to reach a particular destination. So it has little impact on the fundamentals of migration. The hostile environment overall claims powers which cannot be exercised like the, the TV detector van, like the, the go-home vans, the government is claiming a set of, of powers which it doesn't have. And that has important implications, both for the government's ability to control migration, but also more broadly for the authority and the legitimacy which those governments are able to, um, to claim. So the, um, the ultimate, and I think the, the real cost of these sorts of measures is to undermine faith in state institutions. If state institutions continually claim to do things or to be able to do things that they manifestly are not able to do, then this does not just increase public hostility to, to immigration more generally, but it undermines faith, public faith in those institutions which are failing to do what they claim to be able to do. And I think that's the, the major cost of, uh, of this, uh, this work. Um, I'll stop there. Um, I, in the, the book, I, I go on to, to talk about um, forms of sanctuary. One of the difficulties of talking about this, um, this set of, of policies is that it, it is tremendously depressing. And I think ideas of, of sanctuary, such as the, uh, the group that Lorenzo mentioned I'm involved in in Brighton, Sanctuary on Sea, the, the City of Sanctuary Network, and this is their, their logo in Brighton and Hove, which is a, an optimistic aim to, uh, uh, an optimistic point to end on, um, tries to respond in some ways to this, this level of hostility, although obviously the sort of responses that uh, civil society organisations can make to state institutions is inevitably limited. But um, please, um, any questions or um, comments you have will be gratefully received. Thank you very much.